Welcome to the principal source audio presentation of The Primacy of Existence by David Kelly. A cardinal principle of objectivist metaphysics is the primacy of existence, which asserts that there is one objective world which exists independently of consciousness. This fact is irreducible and does not have to be proved because existence is the fundamental self-evident truth that lies at the foundation of all knowledge. The primacy of existence is a corollary of three basic axioms of objectivist metaphysics and epistemology. The axiom of existence, the axiom of identity, and the axiom of consciousness. Objectivism holds that each of these axioms is implicit in any act of knowledge. Thus, the primacy of existence is a fact contained within the truths of these philosophical axioms. Citing Galt's speech in Atlas Shrugged, and the title essay in For the New Intellectual, Dr. Kelly explains why many philosophers have denied the primacy of existence and embraced the primacy of consciousness in what he terms the diaphanous model. And he points out the essential fallacies in this model of awareness. A well-known philosopher, teacher, and writer, David Kelly earned his PhD in philosophy from Princeton University in 1975. He has since taught philosophy, cognitive sciences, and other courses at Vassar College and Brandeis University. Dr. Kelly's books include The Evidence of the Senses, The Art of Reasoning, and A Life of One's Own, Individual Rights and the Welfare State. He was recently featured on John Stossel's ABC TV news special, Greed, and is a popular lecturer and talk show guest. Dr. Kelly is founder, and since 1990, the executive director of the Institute for Objectivist Studies in Poughkeepsie, New York. This lecture was given in 1985 at the Jefferson School Conference, where Dr. Kelly presented a lucid defense of objectivism's standard of the primacy of existence, thus clearing the way for a rational theory of knowledge. At some point within the last uh, 15 minutes or so, probably the last five, every one of you walked into the classroom. You probably took a glance around to orient yourself. You saw a room with a podium in front. You saw seats arranged in rows. You saw the blackboards, the walls, the ceiling with all the junk on it. You saw people. You recognized some of them. And finally, you chose a seat and went and sat down in it. Now, you probably did all this pretty much without thinking about it. You didn't really need to think about it. This is not a high-demand cognitive task. You've done it a thousand times before. When you saw someone you recognized, the recognition was automatic and immediate, and you assumed it was accurate. You probably did not entertain the hypothesis that the person you saw was a robot or an imposter, and you didn't ask yourself what reason you had for thinking that such an hypothesis might be false. When you took in the room at a glance, you probably were not consumed by anxiety about whether your senses were reliable. You didn't ask yourself whether the objects in your visual field, the whole array of tables, chairs, podium, etc., whether that whole array might be just subjective appearances. You did not consider in your minds any of the following hypotheses, that you were really home in bed, dreaming, that you were having a psychotic hallucination, that you were the victim of an evil demon, or that you were really a brain in a vat detached from the rest of your body with electrodes uh, stimulating your sensory cortex and scientists manipulating the electrodes to give you the experience of being in a room. Maybe you were thinking, I can't look inside your mind, but I would put a certain amount of money (laughs) on the proposition that you weren't. When you took your seats a few minutes ago, You probably looked briefly at the chair to make sure there were no visible defects, and you sat down. You did it on the assumption that this chair would behave as other chairs behave, other seats in this case, since they're they're connected, uh, that it would sit there quietly supporting your weight. You didn't worry that your past experience with chairs might be no guide to the present or the future. You did not entertain the hypothesis that causality might be an arbitrary human construct that we impose on reality, and that the causal relation between the chair's nature and its actions might change randomly and unpredictably. So you sat down in perfect confidence that the seat would support you. You were not worried 
that it might do something radically different instead, that it might put its arms around you, <laughs> or rise up 10 feet in the air, or suddenly start complaining that its feet were getting tired. In short, when you entered the room, you assumed that your faculties were functioning as tools of cognition, and that they were doing business with an objective reality in which objects exist and have an identity subject to causal law, independently of your perception of them. In this respect, you're perfectly normal. Most philosophers would say you're wrong. It's not that the philosophers believe that our senses always deceive us, or that there is no objective reality and the world we experience is only an illusion. Some philosophers believe that, but I, I don't think it's the majority view today. For one thing, it's too systematic in principle. <laughs> so it's not that they believe you were wrong to believe what you did. Okay? They think you were wrong to take it for granted as something not requiring proof. Most philosophers today hold that the existence of an objective world and the reliability of our senses are problematic. They are conclusions that have to be established by proof or argument. All the hypotheses that I mentioned, from the brain in the bat to the chair rising up 10 feet in the air, all of these are considered to be logical possibilities that you must consider and refute before you can rationally have confidence in your senses. In other words, most philosophers today are not skeptics themselves, but they view skepticism as a logically coherent position that has to be considered and refuted by offering evidence against it. Now, objectivism rejects this approach entirely. A cardinal principle of objectivist metaphysics and epistemology is the primacy of existence. The primacy of existence says, in effect, you can take it for granted. There is an objective world, our cognitive faculties are capable of identifying this world, and these are axiomatic truths. The primacy of existence cannot be validated by proof because it lies at the foundation of all proof, and it does not have to be validated by proof because it is self-evident. This afternoon, I'm going to talk about the primacy of existence, what it means and how it is validated. Next time uh, on Friday, I'll talk about some more specific applications to sense perception. Now, I assume that, <clears throat> excuse me, I assume that most of you have some familiarity with the basic concept of the primacy of existence. Uh, from Ayn Rand's writings, or from Dr. Peikoff's lectures, or perhaps also from an essay I wrote several years ago in the Objectivist Forum. So, while I am going to cover the basics, I'm also going to discuss some of the further implications and refinements and historical connections and so on. I also assume that I don't have to convince this audience uh, how important the primacy of existence is and how, and how pertinent it is to a conference on the intellectual foundations of a free society. Every assault on freedom has begun with an assault on reason. And every assault on reason has begun by attacking man's confidence that his mind, operating on the basis of sense perception, is capable of grasping reality objectively. If a culture abandons the primacy of existence as an intellectual foundation, it will also, in due course, lose its freedom too. So, without any further preface, let's get to work. First. What does a primacy of existence mean? What does it say as a philosophical thesis? What it says as a philosophical thesis <clears throat> can be broken down into two main components. I'm going to formulate these as separate assertions, but I want to stress at the outset that these separate assertions cannot be divorced. They're really two uh, aspects or two um, perspectives on the same basic fact. Okay, the first assertion is that existence exists independently of consciousness. There's a world out there. It exists and it is what it is regardless of our thoughts, our wishes, or our fears about it, regardless of our minds. Okay, facts are facts. Facts are not malleable. They don't depend on our recognition or our approval. The second point is that consciousness is not independent of existence. It's dependent. Consciousness is primarily an outward focus on the world. All the contents of our minds, our perceptual experience, our thoughts and ideas, all of these derive in one way or another from some cognitive contact that we've had with reality. Consciousness is outer directed. It always involves a relationship to what is external to itself. Okay, so those are the two main points. 
Now, <clears throat> right away I hear you murmuring to yourselves with objections. So let me address those. Objection number one. What about self-awareness? When I introspect, my awareness is inner-directed, not outer-directed. Well, that's true enough, and the primacy of existence does not deny that. But let's look at what happens when you introspect. Suppose you're monitoring um, an emotion, say a feeling of anger. Well, if you're angry, you must be angry at someone or about something. That is, your anger is outer-directed. Right? Or suppose you're, you are introspectively examining your beliefs. You're asking yourself what you really believe. A belief has to be a belief about something, about some fact or issue or person or whatever. In other words, introspection is inner-directed, but it involves a focus on conscious states that are themselves directed outward at reality. And without those primary states directed outward, there would be nothing to introspect on. You would look inward and find nothing. Okay, so self-consciousness presupposes some prior consciousness of the world, and that's all that the primacy of existence says. Objection number two. How can I say that consciousness depends on reality for its contents when the contents of some people's minds, and let's face it, our own sometimes, uh, are out of touch with reality? Okay? There are fantasies and delusions and self-deceptions. There are false beliefs. And even beyond falsity, there's a kind of, uh, kind of mental mush, conceptual hash that we observe when politicians open their mouths. <laughs> All this is true again. Consciousness is active in processing the contents that it derives from reality. In this respect, it can misfunction, it can make mistakes, it can make a hash out of things. We can organize and rearrange the material provided by our senses, just as in the material realm, technology can structure matter to serve our purposes. But just as technology can't create matter out of nothing, consciousness cannot originate its own contents out of nothing. What the primacy of existence says is that at a fundamental level, the mind is metaphysically passive. Until it responds to what is outside it, it has no contents to work with. So, the primacy of existence says that existence exists independently of consciousness. Consciousness is identification. Its function is to identify what exists outside it. In the traditional terminology of the subject-object relationship, which the philosophers in the room will be familiar with, we can put it this way. The relation between the objects of knowledge and the conscious subject of knowledge is not a relation of equals. Okay? The object is primary. It sets the terms of cognition. And the role of the subject is to make his thoughts conform to the object. Okay? So, for example, a belief is true if it identifies a fact that exists out in the world. The primacy of existence also means that at a fundamental level, there can be no question or doubt about the validity of consciousness. Now, it's true, as I said, that in the conceptual realm, we can make mistakes. We can arrive at wrong conclusions. Uh, that's why we need epistemology, to give us some guideline for avoiding such conclusions. But because consciousness is metaphysically passive, it is not possible for it to be fundamentally out of touch with the world. In particular, as we'll see uh, next time in some detail, there can be no such thing as an invalid or false perception. So if the primacy of existence is true, then we can dismiss the skeptical notion that perceptual experience might be a complete illusion. That notion is a metaphysical impossibility if the primacy of existence is true. Remember, I'm just presenting to you the thesis now. I'm not validating it yet. In philosophy, uh, people who defend the primacy of existence are known as realists. For obvious reasons, they believe in reality. Uh, although you have to be somewhat careful with this term because it's not used consistently. But when I use it, I mean those who adopt the primacy of existence. And the classical, classical example of a realist would be Aristotle. By way of contrast, let's look now at the opposing doctrine, which is called the primacy of consciousness. The primacy of consciousness can be formulated in terms of the same two issues that I used to define the primacy of existence. First, it says that reality is dependent on the mind. The world is created, or at least it's shaped and given identity by consciousness. The objects of knowledge depend on the subject. They depend on our thoughts, 
on our language, on us in one way or another. And secondly, the primacy of consciousness says that consciousness is not dependent on anything outside itself. It is metaphysically active. It is capable of originating all its own contents. So in this view, it's consciousness that has the upper hand in the subject-object relationship. Consciousness sets the terms for cognition, and the objects have to conform to consciousness. Proponents of this view in philosophy are called idealists. Again, for obvious reasons, the primacy of ideas. Now, most people find it hard to believe that anyone actually believes the primacy of consciousness. I mean, the whole idea is its outrageous. Uh, we can all see how someone might embrace the doctrine implicitly. Uh, after all, if someone evades an unpleasant fact, what he's doing implicitly is saying, the fact won't exist if I don't recognize it. But who would defend the doctrine explicitly? Well, just to convince you that I'm not making this up, let me quote from the most profound and consistent advocate of the primacy of consciousness, who was Immanuel Kant. Hitherto it has been supposed Kant says in his major work, that all our knowledge must conform to the objects. But he argues that under that supposition, every effort to establish the validity of consciousness has failed. So, quote, the experiment, <coughs> excuse me, the experiment therefore ought to be made whether we should not succeed better with the problems of metaphysic by assuming that the objects must conform to our mode of cognition. End quote. Kant, in fact, is the father of idealism because although there were other philosophers who adopted the idea in a partial or implicit way before Kant, Kant adopted this, the idea wholesale. And he advocated the primacy of consciousness as a clear and explicit doctrine. And in the two centuries since he wrote, his followers um, have adopted the idea that the objects conform to the mode of cognition in a thousand different forms and varieties. Uh, today, for example, I would say that the most prevalent version is cultural relativism, which says that people in different cultures live in different realities. And they don't mean by different realities, like different realities. <laughs> we sometimes say they mean literally different realities. Uh, realities that are shaped by the languages, that they, languages they speak, uh, their customs, mores, their conceptual schemes, their worldview, or whatever. Okay. Now, at several points along the way, I have mentioned skepticism. <clears throat> what does the skeptic fit in this picture? Doesn't the skeptic endorse the primacy of consciousness? So what's the difference between skepticism and idealism? Okay, that's a good question. Well, there is a difference, and to see what it is, consider again the two aspects of the primacy of existence that I used in uh, defining it. A realist says, first of all, that existence, the object of knowledge, exists independently of the mind. That's point one. Point two is that consciousness is metaphysically passive. It can't create its own contents and can't be fundamentally out of touch with reality. The primacy of consciousness denies both of those points, so the idealist is a polar opposite of the realist. But the skeptic doesn't go that far. The skeptic denies point two. That is, he says consciousness could create all of its own contents. And all the skeptical hypotheses that I mentioned earlier, that you could be dreaming, that you could be hallucinating, that the world might not be the way it seems, all of these are based on the assumption that consciousness could have originated the contents of your experience out of itself. Okay. But the skeptic does not go on as the idealist does to deny point one. On point one, the skeptic sides with realism. Okay, this is the external independent existence of the world. Of course, the skeptic claims that we don't know and can't know for sure whether there is an independent objective reality out there, okay? which is point one. He says we can't know that for sure. But he assumes that con if consciousness were to be valid, it would have to be capable of grasping such an independent reality. In other words, he accepts the realist standard for the validity of consciousness, even though he doesn't think consciousness, consciousness can meet that standard. Okay, so. Is this distinction clear? The skeptic is trying to split the difference between primacy of existence and primacy of consciousness. Uh, and therefore, it's not, the skeptic is not quite the same thing as the idealist. <coughs> However, having said that, I have to say also, remember I said earlier, you can't divorce the two points. You can't, not really. 
skepticism always does lead eventually to idealism. For if people believe that on the primacy of existence standard knowledge, knowledge is impossible, then they will be ripe for a philosopher who urges them to reject that standard and embrace the primacy of consciousness all the way. Right? And if that there's a certain reasonableness to doing so. Once your standards get out of kilter with your belief about consciousness, it's not unreasonable to adopt the standards, uh, to change the standards. So in the history of philosophy, the primary example of this is that David Hume, the skeptic of the 18th century, prepared the way for Kant, the idealist. <clears throat> Maybe to um, help keep some of these relationships straight, it would help if I give you uh, an analogy. Suppose there are three people uh, driving a car down a road. Okay? One's a realist, one's a skeptic, one's an idealist. The realist is driving, and he's driving the way you and I drive. He, he looks at the road, and he steers accordingly. But the skeptic is worried. What if the road made a turn and you didn't see it, he says. How can you be sure you're steering the car right? People have accidents, you know. How can, we, how can you be sure we won't go in the ditch? How can you be sure we haven't already gone in the ditch and we're all just hallucinating? <laughs> then the idealist joins the conversation. His name is Kant, and he says, hitherto it has been supposed that our steering must conform to the road. But on this supposition, it has proved impossible to establish the validity of our steering. The experiment therefore ought to be made whether we should would not have more success with the problems of driving by assuming that the road must conform to our steering. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> now, despite my dig, my recent dig at uh, the skeptics and idealists, I haven't really refuted their position, nor have I validated the primacy of existence. Uh, what I've done is to explain what the doctrines say. So let's turn now to the issue of validation. I said before that the primacy of existence is axiomatic. It's a fundamental, self-evident truth that lies at the base of all our knowledge. But it's not, strictly speaking, an axiom itself. It's a corollary of the three basic axioms of objectivist metaphysics and epistemology. And these are, let me, I hope these are familiar to you. First, the axiom of existence. That something exists, that existence exists, that what is, is. These are different ways of formulating the primary, basic, unanalyzable fact of existence. Second, the axiom of identity. That whatever is, is something specific. A thing has an identity, a definite, determinate identity. It is what it is. A is A. And third, the axiom of consciousness. That consciousness exists and that one is conscious. Now, objectivism holds that each of these axioms is implicit in any act of knowledge, from the simplest sensation to the theory of relativity. There's always something that we know, that is, something must exist to be known. There must be something to be known about it. That is, it must have some identity. And of course, our knowing it reflects the fact that we're conscious. The primacy of existence is a corollary of these facts. It's not a separate fact that is derived from them by any process of proof. This is not a, a deductive system like in geometry here that we're talking about. The primacy of existence is a restatement of what is implicit in these facts, the axiomatic facts, when we examine them as a totality, when we take them as a single package. <clears throat> Consider the two facts, the primacy, uh, the uh, facts of consciousness and of, and of existence. To be conscious is to be conscious of something. Consciousness is inherently relational. It's always directed on something that is external to itself. Okay. Despite the claims of transcendental, uh, transcendental meditation, there's no such thing as pure consciousness devoid of all content. And to be conscious of nothing would be to be unconscious. Okay, all of this is implicit in the axiom of consciousness. It's part of what we grasp when we grasp that we are conscious. What are we conscious of then? Another state of consciousness? Well, then that state must be the consciousness of something, as in introspection. At some point, consciousness must be conscious of something outside itself, 
You can't have an infinite regress of consciousness, of consciousness, of consciousness, etc. Okay? In this respect, then, the primacy of existence expresses the relationship between the primary facts of existence and consciousness. Okay? Furthermore, something which exists must have some identity. It has to be something specific. So the awareness of something which exists must be the awareness of at least some aspect of its identity. Now, suppose someone agreed that a thing's existence does not depend on consciousness, but claimed that consciousness is the source of its identity. That notion would violate the axiom of identity. A thing is what it is, not what consciousness makes out of it. If consciousness, if our minds created the identity of their objects, then those objects would not have an identity prior to our being conscious of them. Okay, they would exist, remember, we've agreed to that, they exist, but they would not be anything in particular, and that's impossible. To be is to be something. So in this respect, the primacy of existence reflects the relationship between the primary facts of consciousness and identity. And it can be expressed in the statement, consciousness is identification. Okay, <clears throat> in short, if we understand the axioms, we can see that the primacy of existence is not a new fact, but something already implicit in them or contained in them. If we know that the axioms are true, therefore, then we'll know that the primacy of existence is true. So the epistemological question is, how do we know that the axioms are true? In this context, it's important to uh, grasp two features of a philosophical axiom. First, that it identifies a fundamental fact, and second, that it is self-evident. I want to look at each of these features in turn, fundamentality and self-evidence. Okay. Fundamentality. An axiom identifies a, fun a fundamental fact. The facts of existence, identity, and consciousness are primary. They're not analyzable in terms of other facts or other concepts. They are the epistemological bedrock. They lie at the base of all our knowledge. They are implicit in and presupposed by all the rest of our knowledge. So they can't be derived from prior knowledge by any process of proof because there is no prior knowledge. There is no knowledge prior to them. And any effort to prove them would be circular. <clears throat> How, for example, would you prove that something exists? What evidence would you cite? Well, whatever it is, it would have to be evidence that exists. It would have to be something that exists, otherwise it wouldn't be valid evidence. Okay, so you'd be begging the question by trying to prove that something exists. How would you prove that you're conscious? What prior knowledge would you appeal to in support of the conclusion that you're conscious? Well, Prior knowledge is a form of consciousness, and therefore prior knowledge would already contain the fact of consciousness, and you'd be presupposing what you were setting out to prove. Okay? Something's got to be at the base of knowledge, and this is it. <clears throat> now, the same is true of the primacy of existence. Because it is implicit in the axioms, it too lies at the base of all knowledge, and therefore can't be derived by proof from any prior knowledge. Now, in a moment, I'll show you how we can establish the axioms and the primacy of consciousness, the primacy of existence, excuse me, as true. Uh, but I do want to pause for a moment on this property of fundamentality, the fact that the primacy of existence is implicit in and presupposed by everything else that we know. It's implicit in any activity of consciousness, whatever. It is inescapable. Now, I want to illustrate this um, inescapable character to you. Obviously, I can't survey each and every act of consciousness that has ever occurred in anyone's mind. But there are, I, would, I do want to take two cases where you might think the primacy of existence is least likely to be implicit. So if I can convince you that it's implicit there, uh, then you can see that it will be implicit across the board. Okay, first case. Cognitive error. In case of a false belief that somebody has. In any such case, it might seem, consciousness has departed from reality and originated its own content. For example, uh, let's take an actual example of a false belief. Suppose someone, uh, suppose someone believed that Benito Mussolini was a pitcher for the Dodgers. This is not true. There's a certain failure of correspondence here between consciousness and reality. So in what way is the primacy of existence implicit in that belief? Well, to start with, the name Benito Mussolini refers to an actually existing person, historically existing person, and the name Dodgers to an actually existing baseball team. So, 
the person has not made up the content of his consciousness completely, he, is, he has mistakenly combined contents that he derived from some kind of contact with reality. He hasn't made up the content of his uh, consciousness out of whole cloth, so to speak. Now try to imagine a statement that did not contain, did not reflect any contact with reality, whatever. It couldn't contain any familiar words because those uh, express concepts that we derive from our perception of the world, that were derived by somebody's perception. Such a statement uh, could not contain in invented words that had any private meaning for the person in terms of his own perception, okay? or in terms of memories, images, or even fantasies that were derived from his perceptions. Okay? If you follow this through, you'd end up with a statement that had no meaning whatever. Okay, in which case, we're not really dealing with a statement or anything cognitive. We're dealing with physical noise. Okay. Secondly, even though... This is not the second example. It's the second point about this uh, Benito Mussolini belief. Even though this person's belief is false, he asserts it as something that is true independently of him. He was trying to grasp Mussolini's real objective identity, even though he didn't succeed. In general, any statement, any belief or assertion is intended as an identification of a fact in reality, a fact that exists independently of the speaker. Implicit in any statement, whatever is the statement, it is. This is how things are, really. And as a kind of ultimate example of this fact, and this is the, this is the second illustration, we should notice that the primacy of existence is implicit even in the attempt to deny it. That is, anyone who denied the primacy of existence, anyone who asserted the primacy of consciousness, would contradict himself. How? Well, let's, let's work this through. An idealist claims that what is known depends on our knowledge of it. Does he claim to know that? Of course. That means that from his own view, the truth of his thesis would depend on his believing in it. Okay? But that's clearly not what he means. That's not what idealists are trying to say. When idealists claim that the objects of knowledge depend on consciousness, they're asserting this as a fact about consciousness and its objects. They're asserting it as something which is true because of the objective nature of consciousness, not because they happen to believe it. Otherwise, they'd have to allow that the primacy of existence is true for those who believe in that. Realism is true for realists. But of course, Kant and his uh, fellow idealists don't want to allow for that. They claim that the primacy of existence is false. Okay? And when they, say, when they say it's false, they mean it doesn't correspond to the facts, the real nature of consciousness and its objects. So, someone who asserts the primacy of consciousness is asserting that as a fact he did not create even though what he's asserting is, there are no such facts. So he's contradicting himself. Okay. Now, it's important to emphasize that the argument I just gave is not a refutation of the primacy of consciousness, okay, nor is it a proof of the primacy of existence. Okay. Why not? Well, because I was assuming the primacy of existence myself. It was implicit in every one of my assertions, just, it, just as much as it was in every one of theirs. And so if I offered this as an argument for the primacy of existence, someone could accuse me of, and reasonably accuse me of, arguing in a circle. For example, to make this a little more concrete, <clears throat> what I just did was to show you that it's, it is self-contradictory to assert the primacy of consciousness. But so what? Okay. A, co a contradiction is not objectionable unless we already accept the primacy of existence and the law of identity. Okay. I want to stress the point. The primacy of existence cannot be validated um, by proof or argument, including the kind of argument that I just gave, the sort of self-refutation argument. Uh, the argument does not show that the primacy of existence is true. It only shows that it is fundamental. It's implicit in all the rest of our knowledge. Well, having stressed all of that, I'm sure the question you, you want to ask now is, if the axioms can't be proved, then how do we know that they're true? Uh, you may have noticed that I keep putting this question off. Uh, that's a standard philosophical maneuver, but I, I don't want to keep you in suspense any longer. Proof is only one form of validation. Validation is a broader concept. That's the genus, and proof is one species of it. There are others. 
Okay? The axioms can be validated, which brings us to the second of the two features that I mentioned earlier. The first was fundamentality. The second is self-evidence. The axioms are self-evident, which means we are directly aware, we directly perceive the facts which the axioms identify. We directly perceive the facts of existence, identity, and consciousness. Now, a brief historical digression. This view of self-evidence, that it's based on perception, is distinctive to the Aristotelian tradition in philosophy. It was rejected by uh, the modern philosophers from Descartes to Kant, especially by the rationalists. And uh, it's almost completely unknown to contemporary philosophers. If you suggested this to a contemporary philosopher, he would, his eyes would, would boggle. He wouldn't know what you were talking about. The rationalists believe that there, were, that there are axioms, such as the law of identity, and they believe that they're self-evident. But a self-evident truth for the rationalists was a self-contained proposition that made some kind of uh, direct appeal to the intellect, an appeal that didn't go through the senses at all. It was not based on perceptual experience. Uh, in the ancient world, for example, Plato, who was uh, a rationalist, Plato thought that we grasped these propositions by some sort of mystical intuition or revelation. The modern philosophers, such as Descartes, typically held that knowledge of the self-evident truths um, was innate in the mind at birth. There was no revelation. It was just there, stocked in the mind from the outset. Okay, in either case, whether mystical revelation or innate ideas, in either case, rationalists considered a self-evident truth to be a priori, which is a Latin phrase that means it's known by the mind prior to any perceptual contact with reality, prior to and independent of any perception. And this is still what contemporary philosophers think of when they hear the word, the term self-evident, and that's one of the reasons they don't think there are any self-evident truths, at least most people don't. Now, objectivism rejects this whole approach, the whole rationalist approach. The intellect, that is reason, cannot know anything prior to perception. Every attempt to deny this leads ultimately to mysticism on the one hand or to subjectivism on the other hand. Let me just briefly indicate why. If the axioms are not known through perception, then they must be known through some non-sensory mystical form of contact with reality, some non-sensory perception or extrasensory perception. Hmm? Now, that was Plato's type of approach. Or, the other alternative is to say that they are subjective human constructs with no basis in reality. Okay, they're just, one, an example of this view would be the innate ideas idea, uh, that they're there not because of any contact with reality, but just because they're there. Another example would be they're implicit in our language and their subjective social conventions. One, so that's the subjective side. So you're, you're stuck with either mysticism or subjectivism uh, if you deny that the axioms are validated through perception. Okay? So the objectivist view is that the axioms are validated through perception, but the question is, how? When we perceive, we're aware of a concrete, specific object, a single individual object, whereas the axioms are highly abstract. The concepts of existence and identity embrace everything. And the concept of consciousness embraces every type of consciousness there is. Okay, now, this is part of the reason for the rationalist view of axioms. The perception of a single object, on the one hand, like this podium, and the grasp of a principle subsuming everything in the universe seem to lie at opposite ends of the cognitive scale. So how can such a principle be validated merely by perceiving a single object? Uh, to put it crudely, it seems like a wild overgeneralization. Okay, well, to answer the question, to deal with the problem, let's see how it works <clears throat> by looking at a specific example of perception. Right? Objectivism holds that the axioms identify facts that are implicit in any percept, any perception. Everything there is to be known about these facts, about existence, identity, and consciousness, is available in a single glance at reality. Okay? So, let's all glance at reality. Look at the podium. Well, actually, consider all the things you've seen, because that's part of the point. Okay? The people in front of you, the podium, me, the walls, the ceiling, everything. Now, what you see is a lot of different objects. 
And you can identify the specific nature and properties of what you see in terms of concepts for perceptual concretes. Okay. Your visual awareness tells you that there are people here, that the podium is rectangular in shape, that the wall is, is uh, brown, I guess. These are called perceptual judgments, the judgments I just expressed. They, these judgments express in per conceptual form the content of perception, and they're self-evident. Uh, you know that they're true, not by inference or proof, but by direct observation of the facts they identify. If someone doesn't understand why you believe that the wall is brown, there's a limited and there's only a limited extent to which you can argue with him or provide evidence, at some point you have to say, well, look, <laughs> just look. I can't give you my perception. Uh, you have to see for yourself, and then you will see that it's brown. Okay? Now, these judgments identify aspects of the things you see in regard to which those things differ from other objects in the world. Okay? When you observe that the wall is brown, you're distinguishing it from walls of any other color, and when you identify it as a wall in the first place, you're distinguishing it from any other kind of object. So the perceptual judgments you can make in any given context depend on the specific nature of the objects you're perceiving in that context. But there are other aspects of what you see that would not be different in a different context. They would be the same no matter what you're perceiving. Right? Now look at the podium again. It, this podium differs in a thousand ways from other objects that you might be perceiving. Okay? But one way in which it doesn't differ is that it's here. It's a presence before you. It's in your visual field. It's, I, there's no way to express it except to say it's there. It exists. Okay, I could take it away and put something else in its place, and you would have a different perception. But whatever I put in its place, it too would have to be there. It would have to exist. Whatever you perceive, whether it's a solid object like this podium, or um, an intangible object, uh, I'm sorry, a non-solid object like cigarette smoke, or an event like my raising my arm, or a relationship, like the fact that I'm taller than the podium, no matter what kind of existent you perceive, you can say of it, it is. And that single word, is, describes the common invariant fact of existence. And that fact is available in any perception. Now let's turn to another aspect of what you see. There are many perceptual judgments you could make about this podium. Okay, that it's tan, that it's rectangular, in shape, that it is in, that it, indeed it's a podium. If I took it away and put some other object in its place, you would make a different set of perceptual judgments. But now suppose that I put an object here about which you could not make any perceptual judgment whatever. Okay, it isn't a podium, but you can't identify it as anything else either. And I don't just, I don't just mean it's an unfamiliar object for which you don't have a concept. I mean uh, because in that case, you could at least notice some of its properties. I mean something that has no properties. It isn't tan, but it isn't any other color either. It isn't rectangular, but it doesn't have any other shape. It just doesn't have a shape. You can see that this is impossible. Whatever the specific properties of the thing you perceive, it must have some properties. Okay? It must be something. And this is the fact of identity. And this fact, too, is available in any instance of perception. Let me digress for a moment. There's another way that you might um, get at this point about identity. Whenever you perceive, and I would say in any act of consciousness, whatever, you are differentiating something from something else. In this case, you're differentiating the podium from its background. I'm going to talk a lot next time about the nature of that differentiation. But we can see already that any act of awareness involves the awareness of difference. But for there to be differences, there must be two things that are different, that is, that differ in identity. So again, because perception always involves differentiation or discrimination, it always involves the awareness of identity. Finally, turn your attention to your own awareness of these objects. That is, shift from the objects to your perceptual experience of them. Certain aspects of your awareness are specific to this particular context. Those of you who are nearsighted, for example, uh, may be perceiving with less acuity than those with 20-20 vision. You're aware of less, you're resolving less detail. Those of you on the right have a different perspective on the podium from those of you on the left. But whatever the specific nature of your, your awareness, you are aware. There's a you in there, 
right? which you can identify by saying I. If you're conscious, you can all say I. There's a you in there, there's an it out here, whatever it might be, and there's a relationship between you and it. You're aware of it. That would be true in any perceptual context, no matter whether your vision is 20-20 or something else, no matter how clear or blurry your vision, no matter what the specific properties of your awareness are, there's a you and it, and you're aware of it. That's the fact of consciousness. Now you see what we've done. In each case, we started with perceptual judgments about the specific facts of the situation. These judgments were self-evident because we directly perceived the facts, like the color of the podium. Then we noticed that contained within those facts are certain other ones. And these facts, that something exists, that it has identity, that you're conscious, are embodied in every other fact about the situation. And they would be present in, every, in any other situation as well. Precisely for that reason, everything there is to be known about them, in a sense, is available in this situation. You can imagine a circumstance in which you might be mistaken that this is a podium. I mean, you have all have adequate evidence now. There's no reason to doubt your senses, as we'll I'll prove that to you next time. But uh, you couldn't possibly be mistaken. Okay? You, could all, you all could imagine a circumstance in which you might have some reason to doubt whether this is a podium. But there's no chance that you would ever have a reason to doubt that something exists, or that what exists has identity, or that you're conscious because any ground for doubting any of those would itself have to be something that exists as an identity and would have to convince you as a conscious subject. Okay? If you did have reason to doubt that this is a podium, there are ways you could acquire further evidence. You could come up here and look, check it out. You could wrap it and so forth. But there's no further evidence to be had that something exists, that what exists has identity, or that you are conscious. Okay? So the judgments that identify those facts are supported fully by a single perception. And these judgments are the axioms, and they're self-evident. All right, now let's consider the primacy of existence. It's just a matter of spelling out what I've been saying so far. Because it's a corollary of the axioms, it too is available in any perceptual context, and it's self-evident. If you examine your perception of the room, you're aware of your perception as metaphysically passive. It reveals the things you see, it doesn't create them. The podium, the walls, the other people, the blackboard. All of these exist in a world that you are in, not a world that is in you, in your mind. Okay, when you turn your head to look at something, and you start to have a perception, you don't experience the onset of your awareness as the onset of the object. You don't experience the object as jumping into existence. Okay? Try that with the person sitting next to you. Uh, Everything you perceive has some identity. It is what it is, not what you make of it. It's not like imagination, which you can shape to suit your own fancy. Now, suppose the skeptic comes along and says that perhaps the things you see have no independent existence. Suppose, says, says the skeptic, that the things you see exist in your own consciousness. This, this idea is literally unintelligible if we have grasped the fact of consciousness. Why? Well, because we grasp this fact by attending to our conscious awareness of the objects in the room. Okay? From a first-person internal perspective, we, we focus on our own perceptions. We isolate the fact of consciousness, we isolate our awareness, by distinguishing our awareness from the objects that we're aware of. Okay? The awareness is a relationship between ourselves and those objects. Consciousness is that which is not the object, but my awareness of the object. Okay? So someone who says that the objects are in consciousness is destroying the very contrast that we used in order to form the concept of consciousness, to grasp the fact of consciousness. Okay? The skeptic is stealing the concept of consciousness by using it to negate the very basis on which we form the concept, namely, the recognition of an object as distinct from our awareness of it. Okay? It's as if we explain the word female to someone by contrasting male and female. And then that person said, yeah, but couldn't males all really be females? Well, no, they couldn't. If, if you think that, you haven't got, the, <laughs> you don't understand what the two things are. And similarly with consciousness and its objects. Okay, the primacy of existence, therefore, is not only fundamental and inescapable, it is self-evident. 
I've established that it's true now, not by proving it, but by directing your attention to the facts which make it true. Okay? So we've now validated the primacy of existence, and we've refuted the skeptics, the idealists, and all that group. Uh, now, ordinarily, I would consider that a full day's work. Uh, but I'm going to ask you to give me a few more minutes to uh, give you another chapter in this story. It's a shorter one, I promise, but um, there's another point about consciousness that we have to grasp in order to, to appreciate fully what the primacy of existence says and also to uh, make any further progress next time in epistemology. Uh, okay. Let's begin by asking the question, if the primacy of existence is self-evident, and if it can't be denied without self-contradiction, then why has it been denied by so many philosophers? Well, the answer lies partly outside epistemology. Um, there are as many motives for denying the primacy of existence as there are for evasion, subjectivism, for any effort to, uh, to uh, escape the absolutism of reason. And I think one of Ayn Rand's great achievements was her analysis of those motives uh, in Galt's speech, in, uh, for the new intellectual and other writings. Okay. So, to a large extent, opposition to the primacy of existence comes from outside epistemology, but it also does come, to some extent, from within epistemology. There's a certain, uh, certain patch of epistemological fog that allows the opponents of reason to cover their tracks. And unfortunately, it also has misled some defenders of the primacy of existence. So it's especially important that we understand this. Let me start by drawing your attention to a certain phenomenon of consciousness. The phenomenon, namely, that there are two perspectives we can take in regard to any act of conscious awareness. Let's take a person, imagine we're in a psych class and we've got our experimental subject here. The subject is looking at a tree. You have to imagine the tree. Okay? We're the external observers of this person engaged in perceiving the tree. As external observers, we can study certain aspects of his perception. We can study the process by which he perceives. We can follow the causal chain from the reflection of light at the tree to its action on his visual receptors to the impulses traveling to his uh, visual cortex and so on. From this perspective, we can study the person's consciousness in the sense of the capacities, the conscious faculties that give rise to his conscious awareness. In this case, the visual capacity. And it's perfectly clear to us that this capacity has a definite identity and that it operates in a specific manner which is determined by its nature. But there's another perspective, that of the person himself, our subject. As a conscious subject, he directly experiences his perceptual awareness of the tree. From his perspective, the tree is present to him. It's revealed as it is. Okay? From his perspective, uh, this internal or so-called, uh, what, what we might call a first-person perspective, <clears throat> his perception is just the revelation of the tree. Okay? It's a focus or direction upon the tree as the object of his attention. Okay, now it's from this perspective, as conscious subjects ourselves, that we grasp the basic fact of consciousness. Okay? Uh, and therefore, the most, in a sense, the most uh, accurate formulation of the axiom of consciousness would be, I am conscious. Okay. Now, these two perspectives are quite different. In particular, neither one allows any direct access to the fact that is grasped by the other. Let me explain what I mean. From the external perspective, <coughs> we have no direct access to the perceiver's conscious awareness. We cannot literally look into his mind. And no matter how thoroughly we understand the nature and operations of his visual apparatus, his eyes, his visual cortex, uh, we don't directly observe the awareness that it produces. Of course, we can know, I can know that someone else is conscious, but I can't know it directly by looking into his mind. Now, I have to infer it from the fact that he's a human being, um, that he doesn't appear to be in a coma, and so forth. It's only in my own case that I can grasp the fact of consciousness directly. So, from the external perspective, we can study the faculty of consciousness and how it works, but not the conscious awareness it produces. So we can study the process, but not the product. On the other hand, in the internal perspective, the situation is exactly the opposite. 
the perceiver has no introspective access to the causal process by which he perceives. He sees the tree. He doesn't see the means by which he sees the tree. He doesn't see his own eyes, much less his visual cortex. He can observe his conscious awareness, but not, well, it's not directly, the faculty by which it's produced. So he can, study, he can study the product, but not the process of awareness. Of course, he will know abstractly, if he knows anything, uh, that his visual system does have a certain identity and that it's operating in a certain way. You know your eyes are working, right? But you don't directly perceive your visual, you're not directly aware of your visual system in operation in the way that you are directly aware of the objects that you're looking at. And our, our subject here is aware of the tree. Now, so far what we have is an interesting phenomenon. It's no big problem. I, as far as I can see, these are perfectly consistent uh, perspectives. But this is the point at which the confusion begins. Now, this is where the fog starts rolling in. From the internal perspective, it seems as if conscious awareness is transparent or diaphanous. Hmm? Philosophers have taken this sense of transparency and erected an entire theory of consciousness, or rather a theory of what consciousness must be if it is to be valid, if it is to give us the awareness of objects outside consciousness, outside the mind. We experience the perceptual awareness of an object as a kind of revelation of the object. It reveals the object. Philosophers have therefore assumed that to be valid, consciousness must literally be a revelation in which the object alone determines the way it appears to us and our faculty of perception contributes nothing. From this internal perspective, we do not observe the process by which our awareness is produced. Therefore, philosophers have assumed that to be valid, consciousness cannot be produced by any definite process. From the internal perspective, we do not directly observe the identity of our conscious faculties. Not in the case of perception, anyway. Philosophers have therefore concluded that to be valid, consciousness cannot have any definite identity. Now, these inferences are all mistaken, as we'll see. But in the history of philosophy, they've been extremely powerful. Most philosophers have accepted them in one form or another in regard to one type of knowledge or another. The result is a certain view of consciousness which I call the diaphanous model, after the notion of transparency or diaphanousness. The view is that in order to be valid, consciousness has to be a kind of perfectly reflecting mirror that reflects or reproduces the objects without distortion. Okay? Or to use another metaphor that's pretty common, it's the view that to be valid, consciousness must be a transparent diaphanous medium, a kind of cognitive see-through fabric. Okay? A fabric that does not in any way affect the appearance of objects. What this view comes to in non-metaphorical terms is that consciousness cannot have, uh, cannot, the, the conscious awareness of objects you know, cannot be produced by any process whose nature affects the way objects appear. Okay? That is, the process cannot affect the form or the manner in which we are aware of those objects. And this means that the faculties of consciousness, which produce this conscious awareness, the faculties, such as the sense organs and the conceptual faculty, cannot have any identity of their own. For if a faculty of, of consciousness had a specific identity, then it would give rise to conscious awareness by means of some specific type of interaction with the object, with the world outside, and the specific nature of that interaction would affect the resulting conscious awareness, the perceptual experience. So if consciousness has a definite nature, in other words, I'm still expounding the model here. Uh, if consciousness has a definite nature, that nature would be like bubbles in the mirror, which distort the reflection. Or to use the other metaphor, if consciousness had a nature, then it wouldn't be a diaphanous medium anymore, it would be a translucent medium, and therefore things would not appear the way they really are. This whole view of consciousness can be summed up in a single principle. The principle is, if consciousness has an identity of its own, then it cannot grasp the identities of things outside it. If consciousness has an identity of its own, then it cannot grasp the identities of things outside it, and therefore it can't function as identification. Now, objectivism rejects this principle at its root and in, and in every manifestation. But before we turn to the objectivist view, let me just indicate briefly why it's so important to reject it. 
It's important because if we accept this principle I just gave you, then we're faced with an immediate dilemma. On the one hand, suppose we want to acknowledge the primacy of existence, that, con that consciousness can grasp the identities of things in reality. Right? Then, according to the principle, we have to deny that consciousness itself has an identity or that it operates by any specific means. Right? So what we have to do in perception is to adopt the position that is known as naive realism which holds that every feature of an object as it appears in the visual field or the auditory field or whatever, every feature of an object as it appears belongs to that object intrinsically apart from us, apart from any interaction with our senses. If an object appears a certain, a certain way, then it is that way, period. Consciousness contributes nothing. If the sugar tastes sweet, the sweetness is in the sugar as an intrinsic property. If the stick that is half in water looks bent, then it is bent. Now, the last example, especially, I think, suggests that this is not a, a very attractive view. It's not, it's not one that we'd want to hold. So, but we're forced to it by the principle of the diaphanous model of awareness. On the one first side of this dilemma that I'm presenting, if we want to preserve the primacy of existence, we have to deny that consciousness has any identity of its own that contributes in any way to our awareness of objects. On the other side of the dilemma, if we want to recognize that consciousness does have an identity, okay, then the principle would force us to abandon the primacy of existence. If our visual faculty, for example, does affect the way things look, then we, have to, we would have to conclude, if we accept this diaphanous model, we would have to conclude that we do not really see external things. What we see is a world of images inside our own minds created by consciousness. Okay. Those images may or may not correspond to things outside, but as far as we're concerned, they are equivalent to the images in a dream. This is a view which has a historical name. It's representationalism. You don't have to write that down. We'll talk about it in detail next time. Okay. In other words, the diaphanous model of awareness says we have to make a choice. We can preserve the primacy of existence, or we can recognize that consciousness has an identity, but we can't have both. We cannot have both. Now, this is not an acceptable choice. This is not one of life's little trade-offs, like buying a VCR or buying a new stereo, uh, or having dessert or keeping your figure. We, we, need, we can't deny the primacy of existence, and we can't deny that consciousness does have an identity. And we've already seen why the primacy of existence is true, and as for the fact that consciousness has an identity, well, the law of identity says that everything does. Right? Consciousness can't be exempted from the law of identity. And the law of causality tells us that an effect, such as our perceptual awareness of an object, must have a cause, such as our perceptual faculty. And that the nature of the effect depends on the nature of the cause. Okay, so objectivism rejects this diaphanous model of a consciousness and all the mistaken inferences on which it rests. Objectivism holds that consciousness does have an identity, like everything else that exists. It's a faculty possessed by living organisms. It has a specific determinate nature and operates in specific determinate ways like any of their other biological systems. Objectivity begins, as Ayn Rand has said, with the realization that man, including his every attribute and faculty, including his consciousness, is an entity of a specific nature who must act accordingly, and that there is no escape from the law of identity. So consciousness is not a passive mirror of the world. It's an active process process of integration and differentiation. At the perceptual level, the process is performed by the brain and it's automatic. At the conceptual level, the process to a large extent is conscious and voluntary. In either case, consciousness is epistemologically active, not passive. Now this doesn't mean, I've used the word passivity before, so let's make, get clear what the, uh, actually, exactly what we're saying. It doesn't mean that consciousness is metaphysically active. It doesn't mean consciousness can originate its own contents out of nothing. It only means that our faculties are active in processing that content and that they do so in accordance with their own nature. So there's no conflict between metaphysical passivity, that is the primacy of existence, and epistemological activity, the fact that consciousness operates by specific means. To put it in a slightly different way, 
What we are aware of is determined by reality. There's nothing else to be aware of. But how we're aware is determined by our means of awareness. And there's no conflict between the what and the how. How could there be? It's true that as conscious subjects, we're not directly aware of the means by which we perceive, but to infer from that that there are no means is to believe in magic. To say that perception occurs by magic. In any case, it is a complete non sequitur. If we're going to perceive, it has to be by some definite means. If there's going to be a what, there has to be a how. Now, because we perceive by specific means, by the interaction of our perceptual systems with external objects in certain highly specific ways, an object's appearance is affected by the nature of that interaction. The way a thing looks is affected by the way our senses perform. We perceive an object in a form that depends on the nature of our own perceptual apparatus. And an organism with a different set of kind of perceptual apparatus might well perceive the same object in a different form. Uh, but that doesn't alter the fact that it's the object that you perceive. That's what you perceive. When you came in to the lecture hall this, uh, this afternoon after being out in the bright sunlight, uh, the room probably looked darker to you than it does now when your eyes have adapted. Okay? So when you came into the room, you were perceiving the room in a different form from the one in which you're perceiving it now. But you were still perceiving the room. Right? The difference in, in the apparent brightness is an aspect of the form of perception. Uh, in my next lecture, I'm going to talk about the, this form of perception, and um, you will learn more than you want to know about it. But for now, the important point is that the form pertains to the how. It reflects the nature of our perceptual faculties and is thus an aspect of the way we perceive. Okay, let me offer one kind of final summary expression of all this by way of conclusion. The diaphanous model of awareness, given everything we've said, you can see is analogous to the altruist code in ethics. Altruists invent an arbitrary standard of morality a standard that is incompatible with man's nature, and then they denounce man for being, as being sinful and evil because he doesn't live by that standard. In exactly the same way, the diaphanous model has invented a, an arbitrary standard for the, for the validity of consciousness, a standard that is not compatible with the nature of consciousness, the standard that refuses to acknowledge even that consciousness has a nature, and then it uh, condemns man's consciousness as invalid and delusory because it doesn't conform to that standard. In ethics, Ayn Rand identified the essential fallacy of altruism and cleared the way for a rational code of ethics. I consider it an equivalent achievement in epistemology that she identified this essential fallacy of the diaphanous model of consciousness. She rejected it at its root in all its forms, and she cleared the way for a rational theory of knowledge and a complete consistent defense of reason. She showed us the road to an objective epistemology. Now, next time, uh, we'll take a few steps down that road by looking at some issues in the epistemology of perception. But that's all for today. <clears throat>
I, the, the point of your, of your question is certainly true. Um, like any profoundly false philosophical doctrine, uh, it would be impossible, I think, to act with complete consistency on the primacy of consciousness because pretty soon it, it being false and there being a reality out there, reality would um, catch up with you. There are, however, people who go pretty far. Right? Uh, in regard to the whole inner realm of one's emotions and feelings and thoughts, beliefs, character, uh, people can get away with the primacy of consciousness pretty much all the way. In other words, the primacy of existence means not just that there are physical objects out here, it means your emotions are what they are, whether you're willing to recognize them for what they are. People can get away with self-denial and believing what they want to believe a long ways there. Um, I grew, when I was in college, I was part of the 60s generation, and there were a lot of my peers who went pretty far even in the external world uh, on the primacy of consciousness axiom. There was a drug culture. Um, people were dancing around the Pentagon chanting to stop a war, uh, to, trying to levitate the Pentagon. I, <laughs> no, that's true, you remember this. And I assume that they believed it. Now, if you stopped eating or walked out a window and then the assumption that the law of gravity would suspend itself if you stop believing in it, no, no one could do that. But don't underestimate the ingenuity of people in finding ways to act on this. Okay, let me take a question from here. Yes? Um, I've often wondered about what's the distinction between the two terms, reality and existence. Is uh, reality a sort of more concrete term that refers to the human perspective of existence? Is that be correct? Well, I, sh I should actually ask you to ask Dr. Peikoff about this because I think he's expressed it more clearly than I can, but uh, existence, as it's normally used, is, means what's there, what's out there, what exists with no reference to us as being aware of it. The term reality tends to mean existence insofar as we have grasped or identified it. Right? So in, in the, like in the vernacular, people say that, I, I kind of knew it was true, but it wasn't real to me. Right? That doesn't necessarily, it's not necessarily an expression of the primacy of consciousness. It, it may just mean I, I was aware that it existed, but I wasn't fully aware of its existence. It wasn't fully real. So, but in most contexts, I would I use them interchangeably. Yes? Do you believe this distinction between primary and secondary qualities? Or there's no distinction? Um, this is an extremely detailed uh, a question about a point of, of detail in the theory of perception. It, there's a traditional distinction in philosophy between so-called primary qualities like shape, size, number, how many things are there, motion through space, on the one hand, and secondary qualities which would be colors, taste sensations, um, feeling of warmth and coolness, auditory sensations like pitch. I think there is a certain distinction you can draw, but it's not anything like the traditional one. Uh, the traditional distinction was that um, primary qualities are out there in reality and secondary qualities are in the mind. And I think, as I will explain in some detail next time, objectivism would reject that whole, that whole idea. There's a, in my book, uh, I talk about this issue and there's a, a specific point about the, uh, involves the relation between sensation and perception. Um, and let's see if I can summarize it in a few minutes. Secondary qualities tend to be qualities that could be present in a single sensation. A sensation of warmth, uh, an isolated quality. Um, the primary qualities of shape and size tend to be qualities that we grasp when we grasp objects as wholes. Right? Because you've got to see this as an entity to see the size and the shape. Um, and that leads to certain differences in, in uh, uh, how our senses interact with it. Um, I think beyond that I'd have to go into too much physiological detail, but I'd be glad to go and talk about it further with you later. Okay. Yes? Um, right. I noticed at the beginning of your speech you mentioned something about how when we see other people around us we assume that they're not uh, androids. Um, I was thinking in, in relationship to uh, what you were talking about in terms of one, one mind, two existence, 
what about the relationship between minds? How can you tell, for example, if you're trying to deduce that somebody is not an android, assuming you had an android that acted exactly like a human being, is there any kind of direct uh, inductive means you can use to tell? Well, it's true that we don't directly perceive each other's. Oh, the, the, the question is, how do we know? This is the classic mind, uh, other minds problem. How do we know that other people are conscious? Assuming that we know that from, from internal introspection that we are conscious. Well, it's by in, induction or analogy. Right? I mean, it's I know that other people are conscious because they're people and. They act in such a way that you would. Uh, the only reasonable hypothesis is that they are they are uh, experiencing conscious feelings and thoughts and have purposes and goals and possess uh, conceptual faculty and certain kinds of knowledge and so forth. Now, I mean, the philosophers. This is another version of skepticism. Philosophers always say, "Well, yeah, but all that could be false." Um, isn't it logically possible that? since you don't directly perceive other people's awarenesses, that all of you are, in fact, cleverly disguised robots or androids um, that some maniacal computer programmer has put together on the basis of a whole set of futuristic technologies. Well, like, as in response to any other kind of skepticism, the answer to that would have to be, uh, show, before you can say, I, I don't agree that it's possible until you've provided me some evidence for that hypothesis. If it's an arbitrary speculation on your part, then I won't even entertain it as an hypothesis. Uh, in order to say that a certain proposition is possible, that it's possible that it's true, you've got to provide some minimal amount of evidence. And there isn't a shred of evidence for it. I mean, could an artificial entity like a robot or android be conscious? Well, um, is that your question? More or less, yes. Okay. I, I don't know how I would answer that as a philosopher in my armchair. Uh, consciousness is a natural phenomenon. We know it exists because we experience it. But what its causes are, what, what we know it's based on the brain, but what its neurological bases are, um, we don't really know very much about yet. Uh, we have some, a lot of clues, but we don't know fully. So whether you could design something to reproduce those causes, but in an artificial form, I don't, I don't, I don't know. I don't think you could do it in any of the standard artificial intelligence ways that people have, where people have tried to replicate um, intelligent behavior in computer programs, um, but. This is all, it all gets us into speculation. So. Yes? I think that you said in the diaphanous model of awareness uh, that they say that if a consciousness has an identity, then it distorts the fact that it has an identity, it distorts right. what it perceives. Why, would they, why couldn't they define consciousness as its identity being diaphanous? Why, why do they necessarily assume that? the consciousness would distort? Why can't they just define specific identity of consciousness as diaphanous capacity if you wouldn't have that distortion? Well, because what a diaphanous capacity would be is a capacity with no identity that had no effect on the result. But well, why can't they define its capacity? Its identity be uh, complete clarity or complete... Okay, this is a good question. Um, why couldn't... You, why couldn't someone who holds this diaphanous view, this is the question, um, say that, well, that's the identity of consciousness. Um, consciousness just is diaphanously clear. The issue of clarity has nothing to do with diaphanousness. Um, we use these metaphors of looking through a, a clear glass of, of uh, a clear pane of glass or whatever, but clarity is, how can I put this? Clarity is a term drawn from our visual awareness, and it's based on, on the nature of our visual perception. It's not that the objectivist position is that consciousness is not clear. I mean, that there, there are 
clear thoughts and there are unclear thoughts. There are clear perceptions and there are not so clear perceptions. The diaphanous view uses the metaphor of clarity, of, in the case of vision, as a metaphor for the notion that there is no identity standing between the object and our awareness of it, and that including no identity of our own conscious faculties. I mean, so there's a limit to which you can take the metaphor of clarity, um, literally. Follow-up question to that would be: okay, quick. You mentioned the objectivist view then was that consciousness has an identity and has a specific nature. Going beyond that, can you say anything more that its specific nature and identity is what? What would you say? You can't go beyond just saying the contents of what it is, right? When you say consciousness has a specific nature and identity, if someone said to you, "Okay, what is it?" What would you say? What I would say is it's a faculty, a faculty for grasping, uh, for identifying objects uh, in reality. Now, it's here again, we might want to distinguish. The faculty of consciousness means the, the way the brain works, okay, on this, and the subconscious, in such a way as to produce a given kind of awareness. So if you ask me to say something about the faculty, say, of perception, I would, say, I would say, well, talk to a neurophysiologist and talk to a psychologist who will tell you how the eye works, the ear works, and so on. Um, or in the case of the, uh, the conceptual level, um, I would say, well, um, here there's much less knowledge. I would say read Ayn Rand's book, The Introduction to Objectivist Epistemology, on the process by which concepts are formed. Because in this case, the process is a conscious one. Um, so in terms of the faculty and how it operates to produce conscious awareness, there's a lot we can say. If you mean the conscious awareness itself, then no, you always, when you try to describe it, you always end up do, you always do end up describing the content of your awareness uh, and defining your awareness is against that. It's just, it's not the content, but my awareness of it, and that's a, a, about as far as you can go. And that's why so many philosophers were led to think, well, there's nothing to consciousness. It's this, you know, they, they took what we experience about it from the internal perspective and applied it to the faculty. And that's where the mistake occurs. That's a, at least that's a primary form of the mistake. Okay, yes? Mr. Franklin reviewed the um, rationalist concept of the self-evident. Okay, the rationalist held that a self-evident proposition is known, the term is a priori. Um, known prior to any sensory experience. By, it's known by the intellect without the aid of the senses at all. So, now that, that's the essence of the view. But then you ask, well, all right, how is that possible? And the rationalists will say, usually they fall into two camps. The mystics who hold that these things are known by revelation. And the other camp which says they're known because they are self-evident or in some other way are, are innate in our mind or our language. Uh, yes, in the middle here. Uh, man has evolved from the apes. Is there any, any possibility that the higher primates have a rudimentary form of conceptual faculty, or must man's conceptual faculty have arisen by a great leap? Um, once again, I, this is primarily a scientific question. Uh, I don't know of any philosophical principles on which you could deduce the number of species that have a conceptual faculty. Um, this is, and it's not, as it happens, it's not an area of science that I'm an expert on, but uh, let me just say one, a word or two about it. It's an interesting question. There's been a lot of um, talk in the press lately about chimpanzees that can, that seem to be acquiring some kind of language, or the gorillas like Coco, or the, uh, there's just recently one, the, uh, pygmy chimpanzee, um, who apparently has acquired a certain, they, they say has acquired a vocabulary of, I don't know, a couple hundred words. The problem with all these, with all of these experiments and observations is animals clearly learn lots of things and they can, they learn what, I hate to use these words, but stimulus response connections. I mean, they learn that certain things if they do certain things, they, certain other things will result. 
uh, you know, dogs learn to beg and, and uh, learn the connection between the master returning and their food. Chimpanzees clearly have a much higher capacity for this sort of thing, and maybe some other species do too. But in order to in order to believe that they really are conceptual, functioning on a conceptual level, I would, I would want to be shown, I would want to be convinced of a couple of things. First, that they were, could, were doing this sort of thing spontaneously without being drilled and trained. Okay? In most of these experiments, what they do is they take it, an animal and condition it endlessly. I mean, it just takes hours and hours and hours to get the thing to say, see, push a button for CAT when a cat strolls by. As, and that's quite different from the way a human infant learns. Right? Yet you do that with a human infant for a while, and you're frustrated, and then all of a sudden, the kid starts learning quickly. All you have to do is say it once, cat, oh, cat, what's that? Dog, dog. Uh, so that kind of spontaneity is an indication that there's a, a genuine faculty. Work. Another thing is um, connected with that is that they don't do it in the wild. Right? We don't know of any other species that actually, that clearly uses a language in the, in the wild. So it may be, it seems to me it's a scientific question, I don't see any philosophical reason for doubting that maybe you could, by conditioning and learning in special environments, that you could get some kind of animal to the early stages or a certain way up the conceptual scale. Um, but I haven't seen any really convincing evidence of it yet. Okay, do you want to follow up on that? or? Okay. You say that this, this question is the province of science, but uh, Ayn Rand herself wrote in some of her essays, rather matter of factly, that uh, animals are only perceptual and that man is the only organism, that, the only living entity that has the conceptual faculty. Well, I think based on the evidence so far, that's probably true. It's not a philosophical question, though, though it's a scientific question anyway. Right, as far as I can see, it has to be a philosophical question. I mean. I don't, I don't see any philosophical objection, for example, to the notion that there are, that their life occurred on other planets. And if it did, there may well be other intelligent species that possess reason. You can't deduce from philosophical assumptions that that is true or false. It's just, there's no evidence for it yet. And I would say the same thing about other, other species speaking. Okay, but I should also say, when I say that, I'm speaking, <laughs> I've gotten up out of my armchair and, and I'm speaking on the basis of a, you know, not as an expert about science. Okay. Right. You're, you're speaking from your present context right. of knowledge. Right. Uh, yes, in the, the back. Uh, in your first attempt to validate the privacy of the system, you have used the problem of infinite regression. Well, this, the question has to, concerns the, the explanation I gave of why the primacy of existence is implicit in the axioms of, conscious, of uh, consciousness and existence. And the argue, what I was pointing out was that if consciousness is consciousness of something, then it might be consciousness of some other state of consciousness, but then that state has to be consciousness of something and you can't have an infinite regress. Um, now you're asking about the status of that assumption that you can't have an infinite regress. Well, it's an interesting question. Um, I think what I'd say is that it's simply, it's implicit in grasping that consciousness is consciousness of something, okay, that you can see that you cannot re repeat this. You can repeat it any number of steps, but not, you can't go on forever because you're lost with, without this. Um, some endpoint. Maybe that's. I'm not sure. What, I, I would have. I guess I would have to think about this as to whether that's. Why well, I'd want to say it's a separate principle. Uh, that's self-evident, like from mathematics. Okay, we are over time, so let's. Okay.